All right, hello and welcome back. We are now in part two of our lecture on for week five. We're talking about psychological and psychiatric foundations of criminal behavior from the text Criminology, third edition by Frank Smallinger. So we already talked about the various principles, the objectives of the chapter, history, historical perspective, personality disturbances, including uh, psychopaths, antisocial personality disorder, and trait theory. So now we want to get into uh, cognitive theories and the psycho psychoanalytic perspective. I would make a program note here for those of you that have the second edition. All this information is, as far as I can tell, in the chapter. However, it's in a different order. So you may have find uh, cognitive and behavior theories somewhere else if you go back. Uh, it's not in the exact same order, but the material should all be there. And again, the, the text, I'm sorry, the quiz, as far as I could tell, is based upon the second edition anyway. The third edition has more information in some areas, but I also realized that the, the third edition, as I said, does not talk about the insanity defense, which I will talk about at the end of the, the chapter, the section four, the part four lecture. But in the second edition textbook, you do have a whole section on insanity and the law. So it, it is covered there. So I guess those of you with the second edition actually have a bonus. Uh, so let's take a look, moving on to share the screen and our wonderful PowerPoint that we saw already. And this is where we left off in those big five personal dimensions. So let's move on to the next segment. So our next thing, we're going to look at the cognitive theories. Cognitive theories are, are basically theories that surround, you know, what's, what's going on in, in the brain. Uh, we're looking at learning theories that examine thought processes. We want to explain how people learn to solve problems, uh, those that, including those that involve questions of, of value and morality. We want to see how people perceive and interpret the social environment. And there's a, a bunch of branches of cognitive theory, including moral and intellectual development, and some that examines how people process information. So that's that's this section, which of course, you want to really get down in the weeds, which you should, and you should be doing this already, is is reading this material and highlighting and whatnot in the, in the chapter, because obviously, if I was to explain it in, in fine detail, we'd be here for like 24 hours. Uh, cognitive theories, again, learning theories, examine thought processes and seek to explain how people solve problems and perceive and interpret the social environment. So basically, you know, if, if, if I'm posed with uh, a flat tire on the highway, what have I learned to solve problems? You know, some of us would learn that you go in the trunk, you get the spare tire out, you get the jack out, you change the tire. If anybody ever saw a Christmas story, that's what happens in a Christmas story, you know, 24 hours on Christmas Eve. Some of you may have watched it. Uh, it's funny as heck uh, and very interesting. Or you could be like the, uh, I forget whether it's Geico or an Allstate commercial. You got the kid on the side of the road that has no idea what a, what a jack is and doesn't know what a, a lug wrench is. And, you know, how did that person solve, learn to solve the problem? Well, one person learned, as I did, how to change the tire properly. Someone else is calling his mommy because he's got no clue. And someone else has their AAA card and they call AAA and a tow truck comes out and that guy changes the tire for you. And other people, you know, in my 25 years as a police officer, they're just sitting on the side of the road and they don't know what to do. I got a flat tire. Okay, you're going to change it? I've actually changed tires for people on the road. It's crazy that people don't know. But that's an example. You know, people, cognitive approaches look at how people learn to solve problems. And then it also looks at how we, we look at, how do we perceive our and interpret our social environment? So, you know, if, if I see two people running down a street, do I think that they're out for exercise or I think they just robbed somebody? Maybe depends upon what, how they're dressed, what they're doing while they're running, might depend upon what neighborhood we're in or where we are, but we all perceive and interpret our social environments. And to some degree, we all do it differently based upon 
what we've been exposed to over the years. What have we learned? How have we developed? And, and that's what we're talking about here. So first one, based upon the work of Piaget, Jean Piaget, which I remember Piaget, many years ago, I took a course in educational psychology because we're talking about learning. You know, Piaget was, was talking primarily about learning and Piaget believed that human thinking and intellectual processes go through a number of biopsychological stages of development. And you'll find that, you know, obviously in your textbook. And that applies to how people learn in school and how people learn to commit crimes. So somebody, according to this theory, moral development theory that come out from PAJ, is people who commit crimes, people who become criminal, have not successfully completed their intellectual development from child to adulthood. So you, know, you go back, when we are talking in the previous lecture, talking about how someone was socialized, very similar ideas. You know, we're socialized to have values and respect people and whatever from our families, from our religion, you know, whatever it is. According to moral development theory is that some people have not, as they grow older, have not developed morally or intellectually. So it could be that somebody has, you know, severe educational dysfunction, or it could be that someone has the same idea of what it is right and wrong as they did when they were seven years old. You may recall, hopefully from intro or somebody, some other place where you took a course in crim criminal justice or criminology, that in most states in the United States, that if you're seven or under, you're considered not, not able to have the ability or reason to be able to decide to commit a crime. So the moral development th theory are people that have not developed who may have the same thought processes in certain aspects of their behavior or personality as, as they did when they were younger, whether it be, you know, as a child, a juvenile, whatever, you know, somebody who's 50 years old and is still running out on the playground and playing with, with 12 year olds, whatever. Cognitive information processing theory, talking about a psychological perspective that involves the study of human perceptions information processing and decision making so pretty scientific they probably they're working pretty hard uh but it's in your book and there's there's some variations to that like script theory but cognitive information profit processing theory is a study of our perceptions information processing and decision making how do we go through complex thought processes an interesting thing there is you may find someone you know we think that our if you go back to the classical theory we talked about we think people can understand and comprehend what the consequences of their actions are going to be. Well, it's quite possible that someone doesn't have the tools up here to be able to properly process it, that information and to make a relevant decision. There's a variety of things in this chapter that could cause that. You know, I, I told a story in class. I don't recall if I told it on a previous lecture here online, but there was a gentleman in my community who was down in his luck. He was going to not be able to make his mortgage payment. I don't know how many we, how many months that they were due, but he was going to lose his house. And he decided to go in and rob his, his own local bank branch. He happened to be a customer at the same branch. So he hit his face somehow, a mask or something, but he goes in, he's, he's, you know, got the same body style as you remember from body styles from, from a couple weeks ago that people recognize the body style. And you might have the same way that he walked, kind of like the Kensington Strangler with his limp. He may have had the same voice, you know, and he didn't go in with some kind of voice synthesizer to change his voice, although that probably would have been a good idea for him. You know, he had all these different characteristics that were the same. All he tried to do is hide his face, thinking that people wouldn't recognize him. So did he have an issue, an issue processing and making a good decision? Did he not think about, you know, the fact that, okay, maybe if I rob the bank and I get enough money to make my mortgage payment, but if I get caught, I spend five years in federal prison. He didn't process all of that. So cognitive information processing theory is the study of how, how people do those things in their head. You know, what do we see? How do we process it? And what decisions do we make? Script theory, as I mentioned, 
we have generalized knowledge about specific types of situations that are stored in our mind. Those of you that are in a practical job that may be doing the same thing over and over and over again, doesn't it get to a point where you just do it and you don't even think about it? Whether you're running a cash register or you're you know, a cop on a car step and somebody pulls a gun, hopefully your training is sufficient enough that it's natural. You know, if you're doing the same thing, whether it's in sports or policing or, you know, working at the garbage dump, there are repetitious things that we do all the time. So we have these scripts in our head that we're used to doing. You know, my phone, your phone rings and some of you are, are ready to jump to go get the phone. That's what you do every time. Or other people, their script is the phone rings. It's like, no, or the, somebody, you know, knocking on the door. They're looking out the window instead of going to the door like other people. We all have specific ways we do that. And some would suggest that criminals are the same way, that they, they respond and react to, to, to every situation or similar situations in the same, uh, same, same way. So like I said, criminal behavior, career criminals routinely follow developed scripts to guide them through criminal activity. So the guy who I arrested many years ago for stealing cars when he, he stole, he actually stole three cars in one night. Uh, the first two he didn't get away with. And the third one he was able to drive down the street with, but he still had to flee from it. But he went through the same process of doing it. You know, so you may have somebody, no, I don't know. He was a juvenile. I wouldn't call him a career criminal. But if you have someone who is, is doing something on a regular basis, whether it's, you know, these uh, professional car thieves who are, are stealing the car off the street, taking them right to the body shop, stripping them down, going to and selling the parts either through a junkyard or wherever, you know, they follow the same pattern all the time. You may have a serial killer who has a script going on. You know, every single person that he or she kills, they do, they follow the same routine. You know, they dump them in this, the Green River Killer, always dumping them by, by the Green River. You know, you have various things that these people do. So they have patterns. So serial killers are a great uh, case study when we're talking about psychological and psychiatric theories of crime because, and a lot of the other ones too, because we can look at a serial killer and we can take a serial killer and we can look and say, okay, what was going on in his head? Well, he had a brain tumor or, you know, what happened at home? He was uh, sexually molested by his mother, like Ed Gein, which you'll see in the video. You should have seen in the video you just watched. You know, you'll see somebody molested by their father, somebody who, you know, was involved in, who had no male role model and only, only grew up with women. You know, you got all different things that happen to people that, with a serial killer, we can go back and look. So in a video, you saw Gary Heidnick. What happened with Gary Heidnick? And what happened with Ed Gein? What happened with Arthur Shaw, Shawcross? It seemed interesting that, that I believe each of them had like a head injury. So that's interesting. And then coupled with some other things in their lives, the environmental, it looks right, like right, just like the biosocial stuff we were talking about last week, is you had a traumatic, a traumatic brain injury of some sort. And then you had an environmental issue going on and you had something else going on, which all led to these guys killing multiple people. But you even see this in them. You see it where you have that pattern. And later on in, in the last video, we're also going to be talking about criminal profiling. Criminal profilers take advantage of these guys using these scripts because so we can see that pattern. And it also, that's a, there's some other matters that they can tell by some of the things that they do and based upon what we know about the human psyche and human brain as, as who they might be or at least what kind of person, you know, are they married, are they single, do they live alone, whatever they figure out through this profiling thing. We'll get in more into that later. All right, psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic perspective. Have anybody ever heard of a guy named Sigmund Freud? Austria, Vienna, years and years ago. Uh, had some ideas about how people think and how people make decisions and what actually governs what we do. Uh, the whole idea of psycho, psychiatric criminology kind of derived from psychoanalytic theory is, and from medical sciences, including neurology. Uh, like other psychological theories, focuses on the individual as a unit of analysis. So psychiatric criminology is when we're looking at the individual and what are their problems up in here. Uh, psychiatric theories form the basis of psychiatric criminology. So we go back and look at the psychoanalytic perspective is 
some would call like the foundation of psychiatric theories. You have Sigmund Freud. He came up with the term psychoanalysis way back in 1896. You know, that's 100 plus years ago. And the concepts that he developed were later applied by other people to criminal behavior. And it's not like Freud was like immediately talking about criminals. He was talking about how people did things and how they, they made their decisions. Now, if you look at it from the point of view of psychoanalysis, criminal behavior is maladaptive or the product of inadequacies or faults in your personality. So if we look at how Freud looked at the personality, people who commit crimes are lacking in, in some things. And there's some interesting parallels between Freud's theory and what prevents us from committing crimes. And when we were looking at uh, frontal brain theory and the prefrontal cortex issues with Adrian Rain and all that, because he said, you know, that's what stopped us from committing, committing crimes is our, the brakes on the car. Well, Freud had a different idea. Freud, some of the notions they talked about, we have personality, he studied personality, neurosis, and psychosis. He also talked about some specific concepts like transference, sublimation, and repression. And the definitions and, and explanations of those are in your book. And if you watch the serial killer video, you'll hear about some of these things. Your transference is like when I transfer maybe the blame for something from one person to another. And sublimation may be that I replace a person uh, with some other person. As an example of, of some of these serial killers uh, who may have had problems with the mother growing up, who then later seek out women who look similar and kill them. That's basically sublimation in a nutshell. Repression, on the other hand, is when we, you know, bury things deep inside of us. Sometimes they, sometimes they, they, they surprisingly pop out and, and cause some issues. But, and again, they're better display, explained in the book so we don't take up too much more time. So this is the basic idea of Freud's theory. You got this nice, this nice pyramid here. And Freud basically said we had three pieces of our personality. And that was the id, the ego, and the superego. Well, the id, as you can see, it says pleasure principle. I like to also say it's like, I want it, I want it, I want it now. You know, it's like when you're, you're out there and you're, you're, you're hot in a day like today, and maybe you're out exercising, you're running, and you're thirsty. You want that water, wherever you're going to get it, you're going to get it right now. I don't care where I get it. I want it. I want it. I want it now. The ego is based more on a practical side, the reality. It's like, okay, I want it, but how is it that I'm going to get it? And what's the practicality? Do I have to go buy a bottle of water? Is there somebody's hose? And am I going to get in trouble if I use somebody's hose? Uh, is there a water fountain nearby? Can I get it out of lake here? If I do, am I going to get sick? You know, practicality. Thinking about what might happen and how to get it done best for me. And then the superego is, is more based on ethics and ethical principles. And, you know, that's similar to what we call the conscience. So the superego is like, well, you know what, I could get it from this place, but that would be wrong. So when we look at it in a criminal way, you know, somebody who, who wants to have a certain piece of property, so they, they, they see a car that they like, they see a BMW parked on the side uh, street down near their house, and they want it, and they just go take it. And they weren't paying attention, and they didn't realize there was a police officer down the street who stops and pulls them over and locks them up. That's the it. They see it, they want it, they take it. Where the ego, the guy, you know, you see the car, you say, man, I'd really like to have that BMW, but, oh, wait, there's a cop sitting down the street. I think I'll wait until it gets dark, and I'll come back and get it. Now, that person with the ego may also think, well, wait a minute. This car, if I take it and I get caught later on, I get arrested, and I wind up spending a year, two, three years in, in, in state prison, is it really worth the thrill I'm going to get out of having the car for a little while? 
So the practical, that person is, is thinking through the consequences of their actions. It's not like they really care one way or the other, but they're, you know, for their own perspective, if you go back to classical theory, pleasure versus pain, the person at the ego level is, is looking at how do I get it done and how am I going to be successful? Where the id person is like, I just want it. Now the superego, go back to that conscious idea, is this person is actually going to be able to judge right and wrong. Go back to the previous discussion of moral development with Piaget, very similar here. You know, moral development theory with Piaget is, is very similar in that someone who has reduced moral development might be at the ego or the id level, and they're not rising to the superego level. So some of these theories are, are very similar in scope with different terminology. Uh, Piaget's developed a little bit later than, than Freud. So kind of understand that it's, it, they're very similar, though. So id, ego, and superego. Id, I want it. Ego, well, how do I get it without getting in trouble? The superego, oh, you know what? That's not really right. Nettler identified three characteristics of psychotics. Get a little into psychotic people. And psychotics are people that are, are basically very, very mentally sick. They have a distorted conception of reality. That might be the person who, who thinks that the, the spiders are out to get them. They might be the person who, well, if you watch the video, the Aileen Wernos video, she might be psychotic if you watch what she's saying. She's saying that the, that the police knew she was out killing people. They let her do it because they wanted to clean the streets of, of these bad people. Of course, some of the guys she killed weren't necessarily bad people. They were just truck drivers who thought they were picking up a prostitute they were going to pay you know, to have a good time. Not that that's right or wrong. But it wasn't like they were these big criminals that the cops wouldn't get off the street. But that's how she kind of portrayed it the day before that she got her uh, death sentence. So someone with a grossly distorted conception of reality, someone that has uh, serious moods or swings of mood that might be inappropriate to the circumstances. So, you know, somebody who just goes into a, a rage over something really stupid. Uh, also marked inefficiency with in getting along with other people or caring for oneself. And uh, there are, a lot of, of different ones. One is a good one. I have a video that if I find it, I can share with you. It's about this woman who's a paranoid schizophrenic. And interesting thing was she was a twin. Her twin sister wound up being a psychiatrist. So you have this woman who's sick with, with paranoid schizophrenia. Her sister's a psychiatrist uh, as they grew up, but she was sick all through like college years. And part of her, dis her distorted conception of reality when Kennedy, you know, Obviously, none of you are old enough to have been around at that time. And I was just a baby or three-year-old when this happened. But when President Kennedy was shot, this woman was like 10, 15 years old, I forget. She thought that she did it. That's a gross distorted conception of reality. And uh, she had moods. She might, you know, been, been very happy one day, very sad another day. You know, that's also uh, something called bipolar disorder could be uh, in that category and she couldn't take care of herself she had a lot of problems taking care of herself uh, she didn't get along with other people and all of that is a psychotic thing and psychotic it is listed as paranoid schizophrenic it's listed in your book and uh, it's one of four major subgroups so they talk about all four subgroups in the textbook take a look at it uh, another is frustration aggression theory think of Road rage. And we've had numerous cases throughout the Delaware Valley for the Philadelphia area over the past several years. And if somebody gets cut off and then they chase somebody down and they shoot at them or they jump out of a car and they beat them up. And there's, there was, what was there was the one case it was a couple of years ago where there was a football player involved in one and somebody got killed uh, or shot. Some very serious ones. And frustration and aggression is, is somebody who has intense frustration and there's a lot of different ways they could deal with it. You know, they could regress, they could sublimate, they could have some type of aggressive fantasy, 
you know, just thinking about it in their head, or they could play some aggressive video games, you know, or they could also play in a, an aggressive sport or something like that, or they could go after somebody. Direct aggression, frustration, aggression. So if we go back to what I talked about in the first video earlier, the the guy that shot the congressman today and the two capital capital cops and you know, there were a couple of uh, staffers that got injured. Well, actually, one guy was a uh, lobbyist and the other was a staffer. So there's a, basically five people that got injured besides besides the shooter. But this guy apparently was very frustrated with the political process. Uh, so far, what we've heard is he was he had been a Bernie Sanders supporter, very unhappy with what was going on with the uh, the Trump presidency. So apparently, he's very very frustrated, and maybe long simmering frustration, aggression as he eventually popped, and and took it out on on some folks. Now, the fact that he took it to the Congress, did he know they were going to be there? Did he plan it? You know, that's something we have to see in the investigation. But this could be an example of that. But the best example of frustration and aggression theory, the most obvious, is, is the road rage scenario. Because we all, and we all suffer frustration. Uh, aggression can be manifested in, in a lot of ways, whether acceptable or unacceptable. Acceptable. You know, maybe you go to a boxing gym and you, you beat it out, either on a bag or, or to a sparring partner or whatever. Or maybe you go, you go to a regular gym and you work out and you just vent all that some way. Other people displace is when they, they act out on people that were not the original source. You know, a great example is a guy has a bad day at work and he goes home and he beats the wife, kicks the, kicks the dog, whatever, you know, something like that. Or maybe the person who had a bad time at home and they come in and they start yelling at their coworkers. That's displacement when the violence is vented on someone or something other than what actually caused the frustration. Now, I don't know how many of you, when I was a teenager, I punched a hole in a wall. Actually, I think I kicked it. I was frustrated about something and I took it out on a wall. And of course my mom said, well, we're not fixing the wall. But what we do, we bought a mirror, put a mirror over the hole. And then I had a nice little cubby hole to hide stuff in. But that's displacement. All right, another part of this, these theories is, is crime as an adaptation. And basically, it's, there's two forms of, of adaptation. Uh, alloplastic is when the crime leads to stress reduction as a result of internal changes in beliefs, value systems, and so forth. So that's autoplastic, excuse me. Uh, the other one, if the crime reduces the stress the individual faces by producing changes in the environment, it is referred to as alloplastic. So when you choose to commit a crime and it's changing the environment around you, that's the alloplastic. If you commit the crime and it changes your own feelings, behaviors, values, what have you, changes within you, that's autoplastic. Interesting question, something to think about. Can you do one type of crime that could both change externally and internally? And if so, what would it be? Think about it. I'm not going to provide you any examples this time. Just, just think about the concept. And if you can read up it on the text in the third edition, it's on page 90. Uh, in the second edition, on page 69. And read up on those two and think about it. What type of crime do you think would cause a change in both the environment and your internal values and beliefs? All right, this is where we're going to stop for this second, this second lecture. Hopefully, I didn't get too long again, uh, but bear with me. You know, we have a four-and-a-half-hour class where we talk like crazy about all kinds of stuff, and uh, you guys don't get the pleasure of that. So, uh, And you can stop this at any time if you get bored with it and come back. But make sure one of the things I would do is while you're – you know, you've, you should go through the chapter and you go through this lecture – Download the PowerPoint slides, maybe even, especially those of you the second edition, identify where in your book the material that's in the slideshow is covered, and that's going to help you, you know, better get in your mind, which is obviously so that you learn it and also be able to answer the homework questions. Because one thing 
that I find is very important is, you know, you're, you're learning stuff in this class, hopefully. And, you know, maybe next session you have me or someone else for say criminal courts. And I ask you a question about in the criminal court system, what happens when someone uh, says they're insane? How does that work? Well, we're explaining it today. So I would hope that if I had you in criminal courts next session, that when I ask you what legal insanity is, you'd be able to say, oh, Professor Plunkett, I know because we had that in criminology. So it's not only that we want to learn it for today. Some of you are, are focusing careers in probation and parole where criminology is like very important with regard to understanding the hows and whys as to why the person that you're now supervising did whatever they did. All right, so that's enough for now. We'll catch you uh, on the flip side. Bye.